Hey everyone, in this care plan, we will be discussing diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, so in this care plan, we're gonna be looking at a description of diabetic ketoacidosis, the subjective and objective data that's relevant, your nursing interventions and rationales. All right, so let's take a look at what DKA actually is. So it's very important to know that this is a very serious complication of diabetes mellitus that can occur when blood sugars are poorly controlled. So what happens is you get really increased blood sugar levels and they rise to an extreme level. Um, so they're very, very high, but the body doesn't have the insulin that it needs to use the glucose. So this glucose and blood sugar is not accessible to the body. So when that happens, the body has to start using fat for energy. So we're not using blood sugar, we're using fat for energy. Um, and when the body uses fat as an energy source, a type of acid called ketones actually builds up in the bloodstream. And you can see where the name for diabetic ketoacidosis come from. You get an acidosis that's caused by these ketones that are building up secondary to using fat for energy. Okay, so let's think a little bit about why um, this might actually happen to a patient. So we said it often happens in diabetic patients, um, but it's usually in patients who are either newly diagnosed, and so they don't know that they're diabetic, or it's in patients who aren't really compliant with their treatment plan. Um, so maybe they're not taking enough insulin to keep blood sugars low, or they might be stressed, sick, or having surgery. All of those types of things can increase a patient's insulin requirements. Um, so when a patient's insulin requirements change, um, it might be difficult for them to keep up with their blood sugars and to keep them in a normal range. Other factors that are important that can influence this are lifestyle factors, so things like um, drinking too much alcohol and drug abuse as well. The desired outcome for a patient that's in DKA is number one, to maintain blood glucose level within the target range, and then two, to maintain normal fluid balance. So let's get started with our care plan by looking at the subjective data associated with DKA. So things that you're gonna see with this patient is excessive thirst, nausea, abdominal pain, weakness and fatigue, shortness of breath, sometimes blurry vision, and excessive urination. Remember, anytime you've got a patient that's um, really got a high level of blood sugar, maybe they're a new onset diabetic as well, you wanna think about the three Ps, and that's just a really easy way to remember some of these symptoms. So the first P is polydipsia, which is excessive thirst, the second P is polyuria, which is excessive urination. And the third is polyphagia, where you've got excessive hunger. For your objective patient in this, you're going to see vomiting. Um, they may have fruity scented breath, confusion, hyperglycemia, so the blood sugar level is usually greater than 400, high urine ketone levels, Kussmaul respirations, and Kussmaul respirations are just deep labored breathing that's often associated with metabolic acidosis. Um, and then when you look further into the blood, you're gonna see potentially even high ketone levels also. So you've got that high blood sugar level and a high ketone level as well. And with the metabolic acidosis that we mentioned, you're gonna see an elevated anion gap. For your nursing interventions, obviously probably the first and most important thing to be aware of is that you want to monitor blood glucose levels very closely and you may need to administer insulin as appropriate for that patient. Um, and again, the major problem the body is having is that it doesn't have that insulin that's going to allow the body to use the sugar for energy. So you're getting those really high blood sugar levels. Um, and that is what's triggering the body to produce those ketones because it's not able to use them. Um, so when we give the body insulin, it can start to use the glucose for energy, and eventually the body will stop producing those ketones because it doesn't have to use the fat. Okay, your next intervention here, and it's equally as important as the intervention we just talked about, is to monitor fluid and electrolytes very, very closely to prevent dehydration and complications such as hyponatremia, so a drop in sodium, and hyperkalemia. So those are really important to try and, and monitor so that we can prevent those issues. You can also see changes in calcium and magnesium, but the most common ones are going to be related to sodium and potassium. 
Major, major issues can arise from electrolyte abnormalities. Um, the most two common ones that are really problematic are cerebral edema and cardiac arrhythmias. And really, managing DKA is all about a balancing act. So it's keeping that patient hydrated, keeping electrolytes in balance, bringing ketones and blood sugar levels down to a normal level. And actually, this can be really tricky for a lot of different reasons. But the key for us is that we're going to be monitoring it closely so that we can balance it all and make sure that um, insulin doses, fluids, and additives can all be adjusted to maintain that balance. Your next intervention here is focused on finding out why. We need to know again, why is this patient in DKA? Remember, a common cause is infection. So you wanna be looking for signs of infection so that we can treat for that infection. Uh, remember, if the patient is sick, this is going to make their insulin needs go up, so we need to treat that infection so we can get their insulin level requirements back down to normal. Infections that may commonly cause this type of problem for a diabetic patient are things like pneumonia and a urinary tract infection. Okay, next on our list for intervention is you're going to be expecting to administer, administer some medications and some fluids um, as appropriate and as prescribed. Some things that you should be expecting to administer these patients, we've already said, are insulin, potassium, and antibiotics. You also may be giving medications to help treat nausea and vomiting, so be on the lookout for that as well. Okay, so earlier on we mentioned complications up here like cerebral edema and hypokalemia, but these patients are also at risk for having sepsis and shock. So it's really important to look out for signs that the patient is becoming hypovolemic. Um, and when we're, remember, we're talking about maintaining that balance for this patient. Um, so we want to keep a close eye on their vital signs in addition to those electrolytes we talked about, looking for those signs of hypovolemia and sepsis. Um, so we want to think about things that are going to show us a sign of um, decreased blood pressure, um, delayed capillary refill, increased heart rate, all those things are going to give us an indication that maybe the patient's not, is, is hypovolemic and maybe becoming septic. Okay, moving on to our last two interventions here, um, we're going to think about patient safety and then patient education. So for our patient safety, we really need to prevent injuries and falls by assisting with ambulation and making sure that the patient's environment is safe. Uh, remember, these patients are fatigued and they're weak. Um, they've got a lack of energy. Um, so it's really important that we, we assist them and make sure that that doesn't cause any problems for them. Thanks for watching another nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you wanna just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.